Namaste and welcome to Nepal Conversations. Nepal Conversations is a podcast series where we talk to scholars and researchers about the interesting work on various aspects of Nepali society. This third series of Nepal Conversations will focus on unpacking the status of social science research and teaching in Nepal. For this episode of Nepal Conversation, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Neeti Aryal Khanal, who is a feminist researcher and assistant professor of sociology with a decade-long teaching and research experience. Her research interests and experiences encompass a range of areas including women combatants engaged in armed conflict, motherhood experiences, violence against women, disability, marginalization, and reproductive health. She holds master's by research degree in women's studies and PhD in sociology from Monash University, supported by Australia Award Scholarship. Currently, she is advocating for Trivian University to be a dignified workspace and is actively engaged in sensitizing Trivian University staff on understanding and mitigating workplace harassment, which will form part of this conversation. Welcome to Nepal Conversation, Niti Ji. Um, so um, uh, to start off, I, we know that you have been um, you know, conducting teaching and research in Nepal for a long time in the higher education sector. Um, uh, we were curious if you could start by telling a little bit about your general uh, research and teaching experiences in Nepal, and then we can uh, um, maybe start from there and ask some specific questions. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Umaji and Nimeshi. It's my honor to be part of this Nepal conversation. I've been regular audience of your show. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so I'd like to share a bit of a, about my work that I've been doing in Nepal. I currently teach in Triven University as an assistant professor in sociology. Uh, my research area has been mainly about uh, working with women belonging to marginalized communities. I started my research career with um, exploring um, experience of sexual violence against blind women in Nepal. Uh, I have also conducted research on uh, experiences of ma ma uh, motherhood of Maoist women. Uh, so different kind of research topics uh, that I've done has more or less a common theme um, it has been about people who are at the margin, who are in vulnerable situations. And uh, also my interest in research has been very much focused in about uh, trying to support the issue that uh, activism and social movement in Nepal has been raising. And I see a lot of a gap in data and information. So as a researcher who is very much committed to social justice issue, I try to do my bit by conducting research in this area. So that's a bit of my introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Nitizi, uh, and thanks so much for sharing uh, your very fascinating uh, research with us. You mentioned uh, that you, you have been uh, working with uh, uh, people, you, your research involves engaging with uh, um, people who are uh, normally considered as vulnerable groups or also you research on uh, sensitive topics. Um, could you tell us a bit about the ethical considerations and challenges that go into doing this kind of research and uh, and also um, focus uh, with a focus a bit on how these ethical considerations are viewed and handled in Nepal's higher education sector when it comes to, specifically when it comes to uh, sensitive and vulnerable groups. Thank you so much for this important question, Omaji. Uh, I would like to a bit uh, focus on uh, institutional context and institutional settings uh, on uh, ethical research, especially in social science sector. Sadly, we do not yet have any form of ethical review board in Nepal that um, monitors and, and regulates the ethical issues surrounding research. If the social science research that we are doing uh, intersects with the health research, then we do have Nepal Health Research Council. Uh, and I have often myself uh, undergone a review board through the 
Nepal Health Resource Council. And uh, since nearly last decade, um, uh, academics in Nepal, especially engaged in social science research, have been working together to um, form a social science research council but that work seems to be halted at the moment. I don't know where that process is as of yet, because um, uh, three, four years back, I remember attending some programs talking about the formation of Social Science Research Council. So, so this is the institutional challenge we have. And, uh, and I, I recognize that universities and uh, departments could actually uh, undertake that responsibility in that void and gap, but this is also not happening. So um, um, me as a researcher, I am uh, very much trained in um, feminist research methods, which keeps ethics at the very much of cent uh, center of its research practice. So I try my best to be very, very sensitive and very um, reflective of my research process. And I constantly try to evaluate my uh, ethics while doing research. Um, but um, uh, there are a lot of challenges. So I would like to quickly share, um, despite the lack of institutional body and monitoring and regulating body, I would just quickly like to share how I ensure I, I bring things into my research. First of all, uh, when I do research on violence against women, there are often situations where uh, you have to interview women who have undergone the trauma of uh, violence. Earlier, uh, when I started my research, it was important for me to uh, explore that uh, voice and trauma. But uh, after 20 years back, I feel it's not necessary for me anymore to um, ask uh, the questions to the survivor and put, put her through that trauma all over again. I think the uh, violence against women resource also has to now shift the focus by uh, putting survivors voices are important and experiences are important. I, I recognize that, but, but uh, while doing that, resources have to be very, very conscious about not adding trauma to the survivors and uh, without offering any form of support. And, and another thing that I try to do is sometimes even when you're doing research on non-violence related issue, sometimes you, uh, your, your um, participant may suddenly share experiences of trauma and abuse. So in this context, I I try to share with them the supportive services that I know of and also ask if they need my help to connect to these services. And um, since 2019, after I uh, returned from my PhD and started teaching in Tribune University, um, I do a lot of supervision in master's level and field level. And I have recently started PhD supervision. So I have started integrating um, ethics into my teaching practices and also in my supervision practices. But I recognize that we really, really need to have a broader debate about ethics of social science research. We urgently need an institutional body to uh, regulate and monitor this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Nitiji. I just want to pick on your point about, which is really uh, interesting that you're, um, you know, you're trying to integrate your research experiences in, um, in issues related to trauma and violence into your teaching, which is really fascinating. Um, just build, to pick on that point, uh, we also understand that you, for the last few years, you've been working on making higher education in Nepal in general, uh, but also in your own work setting in Trivan University in particular, uh, you know, trying to make it a more safe and dignified space for teaching and research. Um, and that's really interesting, and I think such an important work that you're doing. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about this experience a bit, you know, why this focus and, you know, in your gen general experience of leading this effort? Thank you so much for asking this very, very important question, Nimesi. Uh, I think it's time uh, it's actually beyond time we start talking about it. We are already a lot behind to talk about this issue. I really thank my 
students, survivors, Manisha and Nisha, who took courage to share about their experience of trauma and abuse. They shared that uh, in October 2018, and uh, more than three to four years back since they share their stories of abuse. So after that sharing, that was, uh, I think the Me Too movement in academia gained more momentum after that. It's not that there, there weren't any cases of abuse before that, but um, um, being in Nepal, uh, all institutions are embedded within misogyny and patriarchy, and university is not an exception. Uh, harassment that uh, women and marginalized communities within university face has become such commonplace, a part of a scene, a background scene, that people have even stopped noticing it. Even I myself, when I went uh, through abuse in early 2020, after, you know, advocating so long since 2018, um, uh, giving voice to stories of uh, women being abused in the university, I myself was harassed within the university premises. My students were right there, other colleagues were right there, but interestingly, they didn't see me being violated. They were right there. So, so it's, it's very much, uh, invisible, and there's an expectation that people who suffer, people who have been violated, have to just tolerate and get on with it. So when survivors start to raising voice, they are seen as a troublemaker. They are seen as people who are, uh, you know, destroying the integrity of the department, destroying the reputation of the university. So, so in the midst of all this backlash, I, I started raising voices on this, but while saying, I, I, I totally recognize that it's not the journey that I have taken alone. Um, I am working together with many, many different individuals that includes in, uh, students, academics, and uh, uh, academics who are spread all over the world. With their support, um, I, I am trying to do my best to raise voice, write about it, and also push the institution to make the um, uh, policies, which um, we haven't have made much progress in that department yet. Trivian University doesn't have any kind of institutional policy that protects um, students, academics from being uh, harassed within the university. So that is an urgent work that I'm trying to push through working together with other colleagues. But however, um, after 2019, uh, different people have started speaking up. Uh, there, have, there has been recognition that this problem really exists in the, in the university. So this has opened up conversations. People are now aware that this is a problem. And also, I think there has been perpetrators are slightly discouraged now because earlier offenders uh, especially offenders, there, there are a lot of serial offenders who have been getting away with a lot of abuse because they were never questioned, they were, they were never held accountable for what they did. But now um, offenders are also a bit aware that uh, if, if they continue that kind of misogynist and problematic behavior, they might be potentially reported or even shamed in the social media. Media also has been giving a lot of support in these stories. So um, uh, also in a few days time, uh, Gender Studies Department is also organizing a program to push this institutional response. So it has been uh, quite a journey, a learning experience for me to um, work on this issue. But, but, but the reason why I'm working is also because it's very much related to my ethics as an educator and my research area is very much on gender studies and gender-based violence. And I realized that it is so easy actually to talk about gender-based violence that is happening out there somewhere in other area, but people hesitate uh, to raise a voice uh, to, to bring activism within their own workplace. So I've seen a lot of uh, these uh, uh, you know, lack of accountability, even on part of academics who have done research on social justice issues that uh, they, they think it's more 
uh, better to talk about uh, social justice violations that is happening somewhere outside the university, but not raise a voice on um, issues of discrimination that is happening within the university itself. So thank you so much for allowing me to share these experiences. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for for this very very important work that you're doing and your untiring advocacy on this. Um, we've been following some of this work and you've been really very ex inspiring. Um, I, I just was also personally curious to know. Um, you know, it's been. It, this is not obviously a very. Um, it's not an easy task. Uh, uh, and where where do you get your motivation to work on this and uh, um, you know, it, we're not in a very ideal world, but what kind of support would you have liked to see? Uh, what are the kind of, uh, you know, support and changes would you have liked to see uh, so that um, you know, this this work that you're doing could go forward a little bit more than what we can see now? Thank you so much, Umaji. Uh, I draw my motivation from the social justice warriors who have been there before me, Nepal has a very strong, thriving feminist movement, and I know a lot of, uh, you know, my seniors who have uh, devoted their entire life to the cause, and that really, really motivates me. Their struggles, their experiences uh, motivates me. I do read a lot of autobiographies, especially of a woman leaders and I try to draw some lessons to that. The most important thing that motivates me is also because I've been trained within the feminist theories. I pursued my master's in women's studies and also I did my PhD very much um, uh, shaped by the feminist uh, research uh, epistemology, feminist uh, research practices. So I think the work that I'm doing is not something that is entirely different, but very much a part and parcel of my work as an academic. So I don't see I'm doing something extraordinary or something, you know, um, exclusive, but something that I am very much supposed to be doing as an ethics of educator who is who teaches gender studies, which is very much about not just uh, trying to understand the gender inequality, it is very much about also what we can do to transform it. So that really, really gives me motivation and energy to keep up the work and also the solidarity of sisterhood and also the brotherhood that I have, that I've found in people beyond academia, I, try to interact with people who are engaged in different professions other than academia, people who are activists or, or and also common, I mean, you know, people who are working on the ground. So those conversations really, really keeps me motivated to um, do uh, things. But, but what I recognize that, uh, you know, things I have been doing is, uh, is if, if I see, on the level of the resource, nothing seems to be doing uh, happening as of yet, but I'm very much hopeful that if we keep the conversations going, uh, we will definitely um, keep on pushing forward for the institutional response. Thank you. Thank you, DTJ. That's wonderful. Um, uh we understand that you've also been uh, uh, you've con conducted some collaborative research with uh, South Asian scholars from uh, Bangladesh and India, and currently you're also working with your students uh, in um, changing the research culture in Nepal to make it more participatory and student centric. And this you're doing this despite the challenges of research, which is again very very inspiring. Um, could you tell us a bit more about this, uh, you know, different kind of collaborative and participatory research that you've been doing uh, with other researchers and with your students? How has been your experience? Uh, thank you so much for asking this uh, important question. Um, um, I, draw, I um, you know, I, I would like to tell you a bit of a story and context of this, how I have shifted my focus in teaching over the last few years. Uh, when I entered into the university in 2011 as a permanent lecturer, I really, I admit, I really didn't know how to teach in higher education. 
and nobody really taught me and it was not even a part of a discussion within the academic uh, circle how are you supposed to teach what are the methodologies how do we uh, become participatory in the class it was just assumed that everybody would know how to teach in higher education that was an assumption that you just follow through how you have been taught, you observe your seniors, how they have taught you in the past, and then you just get on the, you know, trail and then just, just continue that tradition. I also partly did that, I think, before I uh, left for my PhD um, uh, from 2011 to 14, my teaching experience was very much lecture based. Uh, I, I was aware I needed to be more participatory uh, I try doing that, but sometimes uh, being a women academic, that has its own share of uh, challenges in a very, uh, uh, in an institutional setting where women academics are not considered serious enough, intelligent enough to teach in higher education. That struggle very much persists today. The way students even view women lecturers, it's, it's a different set of challenge altogether. And also during this time, I could see there was a lot of debate happening, which continues still date about how Thriven University is becoming dead, how Thriven University has a lot of challenges. There are a lot of structural problems. There's a problem of politicization. And I recognize those structural challenges. But after 2019, when I returned back, I realized that I really can't change the structure. I'm just a mere, you know, lecturer working in a small all affiliated campus in the university. But what I have is a space and agency within the classroom. My classroom is my own. Nobody is gonna come there and interfere with me if I teach well, if I if I do well. So so I started thinking about how do I transform my classroom into a more thriving place of learning. But as I was trying to figure that out, uh, global pandemic happened because I returned in the mid 2019 and then from 2020, early 2020, the classes, classes shifted online. And that gave me a lot of opportunity uh, to experiment, uh, bring a fusion of the online and offline teaching resources. I very much focused on empowering students with, uh, you know, providing the information and resources. And uh, lately, one thing I have been doing is um, a lot of my students come from uh, you know, outside Kathmandu Valley, most of them have been educated in the uh, government um, schools. Um, so they don't always have a strong social cultural capital that uh, young people from Kathmandu may have. So um, uh, whatever the information of the opportunities of uh, internships, workshops or training that I receive from social media host of my friends, I share that with the students and I encourage them to ask me questions if they are confused how to apply. And I try to support them through the process. So that is one thing that I have been doing consistently since 2019. And I'm so happy to see that uh, I haven't been able to make a big transformations, uh, but a few students' uh, lives uh, have been impacted on an individual level and I'm quite happy to see that happening. And other thing is also um, in Thriven University after the semester system came, uh, we have internal evaluation. Uh, so 100 marks of each subject is split into 40 as internal evaluation and 60 as uh, for the exam that the students, uh, that the students give. So within that 40 marks, that the 40 marks has been sadly transformed into something like, you know, routine job, like I call it karmakanda in Nepali, like people, educators are not really focusing how that 40 marks can be transformed into a learning tool. So for me, uh, as I have heard from a lot of job providers that, uh, uh, students trained in Thriven University have um, struggled with the writing. Students themselves have told me that I myself being a product of Thriven University, I know writing has been a lifelong struggle for me. So in order to support uh, students to write term papers, I re every year I spend a couple of days to uh, develop a writing uh, guideline for them, giving them each step by step how to write um, uh, um, an academic essay. 
So along with that, I have also been experimenting with the group discussion techniques within the classroom because I, I um, my classes are about one and a half hour long and uh, generally the classes are, the way classes are conducted, it is about uh, teachers standing in front of the classroom and then babbling nonstop for one and a half hours. First of all, I, I, I found myself being tired teaching that way and it's quite impossible to talk nonstop. And I also wanted students be very much present in the classroom, be part of that learning process. So I tried to figure out a way where a few days before the classroom, I encourage students to read through the text that I will be teaching. And I pick out one central theme uh, of the text that I am teaching. And I, I convert that into a group discussion question. And that group discussion question is a fusion of theoretical um, clarity and also uh, asking students to link that theory with their observations about the Nepali society. So that has made students very, very excited about coming to the class. Uh, often my classrooms are very noisy because students are very much uh, you know, discussing in a group, sharing their ideas. And at the end of the group dis discussion, one of the representative of the group comes over and summarizes what uh, they discussed. And I have seen that the students are quite intelligent. They are critical. It's just that we as an educators in Nepal have not given them that a platform and space for them to express themselves and develop their critical thinking. And while doing that, I never discourage students because I believe the only way you can be a better teacher by being a motivator. Our job is not to uh, judge and I recognize everybody has a learning curve. So, so that kind of engagement has also made students very closer with me. They come share things that they are confused with after the end of the class. If they have any confusion, I always encourage them to um, come join me for tea or coffee. Uh, we sit together and even talk about non-academic uh, issues like um, about their anxieties about the job about their anxieties about their future. So all these kind of things are um, small things that I am doing, but I, as long as I am uh, trying to do my best to uh, being the best version of the educator that I can be, I think Nepal's education system can change if all teachers start thinking in that way. Uh, I might be exaggerating a bit, but I am kind of desperate to uh, help other teachers also adopt similar methodologies that I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to, uh, I, so I share these classroom stories and experiences actively in the social media uh, so that uh, other people who may be, who may have started teaching recently and might be confused what they can do in the classroom. So possibly they can draw some insights from my experiences. Thank you so much. Um Thanks, Nitiji, sir. That really, really inspiring um, uh, sort of uh, things that you are doing. And I, I definitely you are not exaggerating. This is really so inspiring to hear um, about your, you know, even it, it looks like a small effort. It is so transformative. Um, but also at the same time, as what um, Uma was saying earlier about your motivation, and it also seems to uh, put a lot of onus on you as an individual, right? As an educator, you're doing all these things like teaching, innovating, uh, pastoral care. And, you know, so uh, that must be taking a lot of your time. And also it is a hugely responsible thing to do. Um, so I, I would just wanted to, uh, you know, beyond your own effort, are there other, um, uh, you know, is, is do you have a larger group uh, or is it uh, uh, other people who are also kind of, involved in this kind of effort uh, that we also who are outside Nepal can actually learn from, maybe involve in, contribute to, because a lot of our listeners are also early career researchers who are not based in Nepal. So um, is, there an, is there an effort to make it a much more collective kind of thing beyond your own individual and inspiring work that you are doing? Um, and is it, or if not, if there, is there a possibility to come up with a um, uh, an, a collective um, initiative around this particular issue? 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is very, very important question. And yes, we have a collective. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it earlier. Um, in 2020, I came into uh, this group called uh, Thriven University Grassroots Community. Uh, this has been very much inspired and led by uh, Professor Sam Sharma, based in Stony Brook University. So since 2016, he has been conducting series of workshops and seminars, especially to support um, uh, early career researchers and academics based in Nepal, who very much keep, uh, you know, who are very passionate on teaching, passionate in research. So uh, I have been um, active part of that group, uh, currently not so active, but uh, this group really Clearly organizes uh, academic writing workshops, which very much happens in the virtual uh, space so that it is accessible because uh, most of the academic programs happen in Kathmandu, we all know that. So especially academics who are uh, working outside Kathmandu Valley uh, cannot always join. And it fills me with pride that most of the uh, participants of these programs that the group has organized uh, includes participants from the far west, Midwest, from very far flung area of Nepal through the medium of the Zoom, we come together and uh, we have had organized se series of programs. So some of the insights about the um, virtual classrooms uh, and how to um, uh, teach um, effectively through the virtual medium uh, when Thriven University uh, classes shifted online, I was actually in dilemma how to teach uh, online. So because of that workshop happened in online, I picked out some of the ideas from that. So um, yes, we have a community, we have a group, and I am so glad to see that that group is kind of taking a momentum of a movement within the academia in itself as um, you know a challenge to um, growing rampant politicization uh, within the academia in Nepal. But this group is st still is very much of a small, but uh, being a small, it's a group of um, committed uh, young scholars, um, and it's really, really great platform. And I would also like to request you um, uh, in any kind of future upcoming program, um, you could also support us and be part of that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nidhi. Thanks, really uh, useful to know about that platform. And of course, we'll be very keen to learn more about this and also sort of spread the word out to other people who might be interested to contribute. Um, so we've come towards the end of the conversation. And actually, we feel like, um, you know, um, um, keep talking to you because it's so inspiring, but um, also um, because of the time limitation. So uh, basically, uh, one final question, and this is a more a general question. Um, and if you could just maybe talk a little bit about the future of, uh, you know, research and teaching in higher education sector in Nepal, just to summarize so basically some of the points. Uh, what do you think are the opportunities, uh, limitations? Uh, what do you think needs to change um, in the higher education sector in Nepal? Uh, very, very important question, Nimeshi. Thank you for that. Um, I think future is quite optimistic. I am very positive uh, because, um, you know, I see a lot of expansion of opportunities uh, that has uh, brought through the uh, um, sharing of the social media. Earlier, I, I recognized that people used to hoard information, feeling that, you know, like if you tell other people, they might snatch it away from you. I see the encouraging trend that people are now openly sharing about the opportunities. There are a lot of research grants that were not available when I was a student um, nearly 20 years back pursuing my master's. So I think increasing the amount of the research grant in diverse research related topics is the thing that really needs to keep growing uh, that will um, support young generation scholars who are in search of opportunities and platform to really do good research. And another thing that I see lacking within the um, higher education teaching and research practices, we have not been able to uh, integrate mentoring and support for the young researchers uh, in an institutional level that is sorely lacking. And um, that needs to be really, really built up uh, in different level. For me as a 
uh, researcher, especially as a supervisor, I find mentoring very, very important. And um, I have not still been able to do a lot, but what I do is that while any student is um, under my supervision, I try to connect that student with the opportunities or the network that I know of relating to his or her research topic. I always encourage them and share information about the academic conference. And I would like to share with you a very good news that one of my students in gender studies, she had never ever presented in any academic conference before, even in national level. But she got accepted for her paper presentation in um, international conference uh, organized by University of Hawaii, and we are presenting in the same conference. So that kind of, uh, you know, support is very, very much needed uh, because if you're supervising a student, I, I request all supervisors that you need to really, really motivate your student, number one. Number two, you have to connect them with the opportunities and the resources that you know about because if your supervision just becomes a routine work purely about guiding how to do research and how to write about it, I think you're not really doing your job well. So mentoring has to be in the center of the supervision practices uh, within our university and, and mentoring has to be institutionalized so that it doesn't become very much of a, you know, individual effort sometimes, which can be a bit tiring for a people like me, because there is very little you can do on an individual effort, but this needs to be institutionalized. So um, to sum it up, I am positive and optimistic, but we really need to I do a lot of institutional support related program to support young generation scholars in Nepal. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Nitizi, for, for ending on that really positive and um, optimistic note and also highlighting the role of mentoring um, and advising in the higher education sector. So that uh, brings us to the end of the conversation. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, um, thank you so much yeah. for your time and thank you so much for all the important work that you're doing uh, as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Umaji and Nimisi. Uh, I am sorry if I may have sounded like as if I have been doing a lot, but one of the reasons why I share about my experiences is also because sharing these experiences could motivate and uh, you know help other young generation academics who might have started their teaching journey. So my intent in sharing is not to highlight how great I am doing, <laughs> but it is just to you know share that. This is, these are the possible things that you could do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah.